Well, good afternoon and welcome to everyone joining us online. I'm Professor John Fazakli and it's my privilege to be Dean of the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences here at the University of Melbourne. It's a great pleasure to introduce this afternoon's event, which is the 30th Memorial GW LEPA Lecture. This is an annual event that celebrates the life and work of soil scientist Jeffrey LEPA. In the audience, I know we have members of the public, staff, students, alumni, industry experts, supporters, and members of the agricultural science community, and I thank you all for being here, and I hope that you'll join in the discussion later. I'd like to thank members of Soil Science Australia, who the University of Melbourne has proudly partnered with in presenting this event since its inception in 1992. In keeping with this afternoon's theme, it's appropriate that we reflect on the stewardship of the lands that we are on by the traditional owners and custodians. It's their stewardship over tens of thousands of years that has endowed us here in Australia with wonderful plants, animals, and landscapes. I acknowledge the Wurundjeri people as the traditional owners and custodians of the land I am on, and I pay respects to their elders and their families. And I'd also like to acknowledge the role of indigenous knowledge in our academy. Today's lecture will be given by the recently appointed Chief Environmental Scientist of the Environmental Protection Authority, Victoria, Professor Mark Taylor. This lecture has the great title, Urban Agriculture and Anthropogenic Trace Metal Contaminants from the Backyards of Melbourne to Broken Hill. Professor Taylor was previously at Macquarie University, Sydney. His research expertise covers environmental contamination in aerosols, dust, sediment, soil and water, and their potential risks to human health. Much of his work has focused on mining and smelting emissions and depositions, contamination in urban environments, and more recently, assessment of atmospheric trace metal emissions from wildfires. This research includes analysis of blood lead levels in children, firefighter chemical exposures, trace metals in wine, honey, garden produce, household dusts, and drinking water. In today's lecture, Professor Taylor will discuss why we need to measure urban contaminants and how we can empower citizens to act. Perhaps we'll also hear how he intends to apply his learnings in environmental contamination and environmental health in his new role as Environmental Protection Authority Victoria's Chief Environmental Scientist. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to this year's LEPA lecturer, Professor Mark Taylor. Mark. Thank you very much and thank you everybody uh, for inviting me to the 30th annual lecture, 30th annual LEPA lecture. I am um, grateful for the invite and I hope I can share some of the learnings that I've had about urban agricultural soil with the participants today. First of all, I'm speaking from Dara country in Sydney. I pay my respects to First Nations people, past, present and future. And, um, I look forward to sharing my work uh, with all people uh, across the country. So the title of my talk today uh, covers some of the work that I've done um, at Macquarie University with many students, many staff and many uh, colleagues from other countries and also in Australia. And so I pay, um, I pay my thanks to them and my gratitude to their incredible hard work in helping uh, bring some of these findings to light. So um, what I'm going to do is I'll first of all cover just a little bit about my current role and explain uh, a, a bit of context there uh, in my new role as a chief environmental scientist. In this new role, um, working for Environment Protection Authority in Victoria, the main aim is to capture and develop scientific knowledge to support our regulatory decision making, including our new and only one in Australia, uh, general environmental duty, which essentially means every person in Victoria has a responsibility to reduce environment and human health harm from pollution and waste. I'll also continue building and strengthening the science capacity and capability EPA so that we can give the best evidence-based decisions to support Victorians as a whole. And another aspect of this new role for me is in the communication of EPA science. And that's not just to industry or to government, it also includes all of our stakeholders, including community members. There are several areas of immediate focus, one of which is a very live topic at present, given that yesterday the, uh, the parliamentary inquiry report was handed down 
with, on air quality and that forms an important part of our work at EPA and it's an important thrust of some of the work that we're doing at the moment in terms of determining what needs to be done next and why, particularly in regard uh, to greenhouse gases but also air pollution. There's a significant amount of work in regard to the Westgate Tunnel uh, and that relates obviously to the PFAS um, that may or may not be present in the spoil and, and what happens to that spoil. And of course, um, there's a significant amount of work in the Latrobe Valley where there's you know, ongoing questions around uh, air quality and addressing those and also the use lead acid battery plant, which has been proposed uh, for, uh, for the uh, community or, or in the community down there. So in terms of moving from Macquarie to the EPA, here's just a sort of a, a, a board of all of the people that I'm working with currently, uh, including at the top, my uh, researchers, Dr. Cynthia Isley, who's just about to go to Adelaide, and Dr. Tony Morrison. We're working on a suite of projects which are funded both you know, largely externally and internally. These projects are on a run-out basis for me, given the fact that I've moved to Macquarie. Some of them are funded well beyond the, the, uh, the, the lifetime of this year, so into 2022. And supporting those projects are a suite of uh, students and staff. Uh, the two uh, uh, staff members I have at the moment, um, in addition to Tony and Cynthia, are Cara, Miss Cara Fry, who runs my uh, laboratory at Macquarie University. She runs the, uh, the Veggie Safe and Dust Safe programs that I'm going to talk about today. And Max also contributes to that work through his work on the Veggie Safe program. And have a suite of other students that are also working on a range of projects. And, and these really, or, nearly all focus on environmental contamination, human health outcomes of some kind or other. We have some major projects which are still being funded. Uh, I'm working with Dr. Robin Gazarowski on a clinical PFAS study. That's a study which looks at the removal of PFAS from firefighters. And we've looked at a cohort from Melbourne, which was the Metropolitan Fire Brigade, which is now Fire Rescue Victoria. And um, <clears throat> that study is now out to review in JAMA Network Open. And essentially what we did there, we looked at phlebotomy, the giving of blood to remove and reduce PFAS levels in firefighters. The other project that we have related to PFAS is one of a remediation that's using foam fractionation, which is really essentially aerating groundwater to cause the uh, PFAS to rise to the surface where it's effectively skimmed off. I have another ongoing ARC project, uh, sorry, I should say the PFAS project um, on foam fractionation is funded, uh, it's an ARC uh, project. And the clinical study was funded by Fire Rescue Victoria or Metropolitan Fire Brigade as it was. I have another project with Dr. Professor Simon Griffiths, which looks at lead in sparrows and using sparrows as a biomarker. And we've collected a significant amount of very interesting data from Broken Hill. But I'm not going to talk about that today. That work's ongoing. And I have another project um, with uh, colleagues in France and New Caledonia looking at the emissions and depositions and human health risks associated with nickel mining. Um, in and around Numea. And so um, why are we interested in contaminants? Well, contaminants are my best friend and I've spent a significant amount of time looking at contaminants, whether they're organic contaminants or inorganic contaminants through in a range of matrices. <clears throat> As mentioned previously by John, we've looked at honey and wine. We've also looked at drinking water. Uh, we've got uh, birds as biomarkers and I'll talk a little bit about birds today. And we've done, we've done measurements um, in garden soil, uh, wildfire ash, both the ash in the, in the trees and also the atmospheric uh, concentrations of ash. And we've done significant number of studies looking at blood lead exposures in children. Our focus has largely been on uh, Broken Hill where we have access to a significant cohort of data extending over 25 years. And we've published a few studies uh, out of Broken Hill you know, using that data. And I think it's probably fair to say that is the longest and uh, uh, most dense human health and environmental record that we know of in Australia and that we've been able to publish and it's produced some really very interesting insights. And then we've also looked at other uh, environmental biomarkers such as lichens and used lichens which have been stored um, in herbaria extending back over 150 years or so in Melbourne to, to try and reconstruct atmospheric chemistry over time with a focus looking at trace elements. So why 
I always start lectures like this, and I show my youngest son here, James, on the right hand side, because he's doing what all children do. He's picking up a toy, he's putting that toy in his mouth, and if that toy was contaminated by uh, uh, dust or um, yeah, dust borne contaminants, he would be ingesting those. And that is the primary route of exposure. Children are also exposed through eating of uh, soil, it's called pica, and people can also be exposed by growing vegetables in contaminated soil. Children are our greatest concern because of their higher absorption of trace metals, uh, their greater hand to mouth activity, and in particular, many of the toxicants that we find in that, as you will see as I talk, go through my talk, that we find in our gardens, for example, and in our homes, contain neurotoxic chemicals. The, the primary one of concern is lead, and that's associated with significant adverse neurocognitive and behavioral outcomes in children. If people want to have a look at um, my Broken Hill 25 year lead study, there's a short video that I created, and that will get to a five minute video and will give you an insight into the importance and the significance of uh, trace metal emissions and depositions and what that means for people. So moving on to our gardens. Well, I think it's probably fair to say that uh, agriculture uh, typically is a large industrialized activity, but we've seen a significant shift in the last decade or so towards people producing their own food. This study which came out in 2014 from the Australian Institute by Poppy Wise showed that more than 50% of Australians are producing some form of food in their backyard, and it's grown since then. On top of just producing straight food, there are now more than 30,000 beekeepers in Australia. The very vast majority of those have more, less than 50 hives, which means they're small producers, and many of those small producers have a hive in their back garden, like I do, I have three. In addition, there's a significant number of people who are keeping chickens in their yards. And they keep their chickens not only for sort of pleasure, having chickens and the sense of uh, being close to food production, but for the production and consumption of the eggs that those chickens will lay. So the question that I asked myself, along with my colleagues, some years ago, 2013 or so, when we started our Veggie Safe program, is are our urban soils fit for purpose and is the produce safe to eat? Now we had an inkling that urban soils were probably contaminated. We didn't know the extent or the footprint or what the primary contaminant was, but we were asked this question frequently by the public and we needed to answer that question so that people would have a better understanding about whether it is okay for them to produce food in their gardens. So we set about on a program to try and answer that question for the public. And I'll talk a bit about the outcomes of that program and the benefits. So in terms of um, what's in the urban environment, I think it's pretty clear that um, lead is the primary contaminant and, and, and there are a number of other metals as well, which it might, depending where you are, it could be cadmium, it can be zinc, it could be copper, it can be arsenic, but it turns out, as you will see in the data that I shall present, that lead is the contaminant of most significance. And there are a range of sources of lead that we find in our urban environment, old buildings, as you can see on the top left, uh, the emissions from the tailpipes of cars when we use leaded gasoline over the seven decades from 1932 to 2002. Emissions from mining or smelting operations, and this is an image from Broken Hill, and at the bottom here you can see a little triangular cone, and I term that affectionately the cone of lead. Um, and in the video I gave you, uh, showed you before the link to the YouTube video, which we published in, in a study in atmospheric, atmospheric environment in 2017, you can see dust blowing off that cone. Since we identified that work, the, um, the Broken Hill Environmental Lead Program have worked to uh, get rid of that with, with the, the mining company Perilia to get rid of that cone to reduce dust emissions. Firing ranges are also known to cause significant contamination at the site and off the site. And of course, we have the issue of you know, recycled, uh, recycled soil or even manufactured soil, which may or may not contain contaminants. And as a result of all of those things, we have a significant number of contaminants uh, in different locations in our gardens that may pose a harm to human health. And the question that we asked ourselves is how do we answer that question? Are there a, is there a significant harm? Is it safe to produce food in that garden? And you know, where, you know, what are the causes or association with those risks? So we started a, a program 
called Veggie Safe in 2013. I started this program with my uh, former colleague, now Professor Damien Gore, and um, the program's been run largely by graduate students, undergraduate and graduate students. It's funded entirely by public donations. So when you submit a soil sample, we ask for a donation. And um, the premise of this program really is, is unlike most epidemiological type studies, it was to work with and for the community to answer that basic question, which was, are our soils contaminated and is the food safe to eat? Typically, we, you know, when people do a, a large scale study, they work on the community, but we decided to flip that because we wanted to support the community in answering this question in the knowledge that we would get usable data that we could uh, publish for our scientific credibility and our scientific uh, academic purpose. But at the same time, we were able to answer the question for the public about where it's safe to eat, is it safe to produce food? Uh, and you know, what should we be concerned about? And ultimately, what we can do about it. So uh, a quick overview, a very short overview of the program. This, the website is available here. It's available at 360dustanalysis.com. And when you go on that website, you'll come to two landing pages. One will be for VeggieSafe, which is for people who want to submit their garden soils. And the other one is for DustSafe, where people submit their vacuum bag dust. And I'm largely going to talk on the VeggieSafe program today. I'll talk a little bit very briefly about DustSafe. But because we're interested in urban gardens, VeggieSafe is the program uh, that I'm going to talk about and the outcomes that we've measured. So how does this program work? Well, people basically send in their garden soil and the pictures that you can see, these three pictures you can see on the right, these are the packets that we've received post the COVID period. So even though I was working at the EPA, I didn't go into the university, my staff are still working, they were able to uh, go in at the end of the COVID period into Macquarie University and collect all the packages that had accumulated over three months. And of course, I think it's well accepted that because people are spending more time at home, they decided to do more gardening and more cleaning and became more aware of the possible risk of contamination in their garden soils. And we saw that in the samples that we received. There was three trolleyfuls and it took several days to clear and process these samples. So since 2013, when we started this program, we've received more than 22,000 samples from Australian households right across the nation, predominantly in the most populated areas. That means we've received soils from over 10,000, over 5,000 homes, um, and that means we've benefited more than 10,000 Austra individual Australians who are living in those homes. When people send the soil, we collect a bit of data about the location of where the soil uh, was collected in the garden, the age of the home and the construction of the home uh, and, and, a, and a few additional bits and pieces of information. And that allows us to interrogate the information and the relationships that we see between you know, garden soil and uh, potential uh, sources of contamination. We specifically ask uh, people when they send their soil to us to send us two samples from their veggie patch because we really want to analyse what the trace metal concentrations were in people's garden, in people's vegetable patches, as well as their wider gardens. And so how do we analyze this? It's a significant number of samples. We couldn't afford to do it through ICPMS because it's just too costly. There's too many samples, there's too much preparation. And um, the university kindly supported uh, the program with the, um, with the purchase of an XRF and then we subsequently got, got a, a, a newer one in 2017. And there's an example of an XRF down here. We used uh, the Olympus instrument for that work. And we analyzed the soil as is, as is received. So we don't sieve it, we don't dry it, we don't do any preparation, we analyze it through the bag. And we've done some work in our latest publication, which came out in 2021, the Environment International, to look at the efficacy of that and what the limitations may be. I won't go into too much detail, but I'll just show you a couple of um, diagrams here from two studies. On the left-hand side is a study which came out just a couple of days ago by uh, my master's student, uh, Max Gillings on Broken Hill, and where we looked at outdoor soil um, uh, on the road and also in people's gardens. And what Max did there, he sipped the soil to uh, 180 microns and he compared it to the bulk soil. That's the measurement of soil in the field versus sift soil that he prepared in the lab. And you can see the relationships for the trace metal shown are excellent. In particular, it's worth noting that the relationship between the bulk measurement of lead and the actual, you know, more traditionally, more detailed, uh, prepared soil 
uh, that's been sieved and dried, et cetera, and cupped, uh, is a very strong relationship of 0.92. And then on the right hand side, we've actually got the veggie safe data that we analyzed compared to uh, prepared, uh, more prepared soil that was prepared as part of another manuscript uh, produced by another former student of mine, Dr. Marek Rulian. And again, if we look at you know, what will ultimately be the target element, we can see the relationship between the veggie safe data, which is that soil measured in the bag, versus sieved and prepared soil. And this soil was sieved and prepared to 500 microns because of uh, you know, time and uh, effort required to prepare so many soil samples, there's over 500. We can see we had a pretty strong relationship of um, uh, 0.81 between in situ, in the bag, versus uh, more prepared, dried uh, soil samples. So the upshot of all of that is the use of an XRF, which is, you know, allows cheap, multiple uh, and rapid assessment of soils, it's efficacious, it works, it's reliable, it's robust, it can be benchmarked to more sort of standard measurements. And we've done some work comparing XRF data to also ICPMS data. So we, we're confident in the outcomes. So in terms of uh, our National Garden Trace Metal uh, data set, this summarises it's actually not the full data set, it's the data set that we cut for the publication uh, from where this image came from, which is Environment International. It's just over 17,000 samples, but the distribution is largely the same in the updated version of 22,000 plus samples. And you can see uh, most of the samples come from the populated areas of Southeast Australia, very few from inland Australia, as you would expect, there's a very small population. And indeed, it turns out there's actually very likely to be very little, little uh, contaminant risk from anthropogenic sources. And you can see there's a very dense coverage in uh, Sydney, Melbourne, and less so in Brisbane and the other major state capitals. And so Sydney and Brisbane are the places where we received uh, the most samples for this program. So when people send the soils, you know, what do they receive? And how do they understand whether there's a risk or not in their gardens for producing, um, you know, whether their gardens are fit based upon the national guidelines, that's the national soil guidelines, whether they're fit for producing food? Well, they get a summary report, as you can see on the right hand side, we benchmark our data to Australian and global standards. And in fact, we've just changed it just to show Australian standards because it became too confusing because different countries around the world have different standards because they have different exposure and risk factors built into their modeling. We also provide participants with links to further information in regard what to do next. And I think most importantly, one of the things that I'm really proud of, I've worked with a colleague, uh, Professor Gabe Filippelli at Indianapolis University, the data that we produce from this program, all of it, every single, every single measurement gets uploaded to mapmyenvironment.com. What I should say is that when the data uh, goes up onto mapmyenvironment.com, it's uh, double jittered, which means each time you go into the system to look at the data, the dot point moves slightly so you can't actually identify uh, what the specific location is of that site. And that allows you know, for privacy of the people who've submitted their samples to be protected. So the question is, whose soil meets Australian guidelines? You know, where are the problems? What are those problems? And there's been a few stories in the media in regard to you know, the risks of urban agriculture and what that might mean. And you can see there's a couple of, you know, I would say the first one from Sydney Morning Herald, rather sensational, Sydney's toxic footprint, the suburbs most at risk from lead contamination. And I think the second half, that's fine. The first one's probably a little bit exaggerated. Um, and I can explain that later, why I think that's the case. Um, although it doesn't mean to say that we don't need to do anything about it. And there was a story more recently, um, I think it was in, in May, in The Age, talking about specifically Melbourne suburbs, where there's too much lead in the veggie gardens. And I'll show some of the data. So what do we say when we look at the data? What does it tell us about what the relationships are spatially and, um, and in terms of the construction of people's homes? So. What we've done here, we've combined the house age and external painted surfaces to understand and the distance uh, from, the, from the city centre to try and understand that sort of spatial distribution. So if we look at the top diagram, what this does, this captures the relationship between city centre, distance from the city centre and soil lead concentration. The concentration for all the other elements that we measure, there's actually eight of them. 
uh, that we measure in the trace in the veggie safe program they're all captured in the uh, supplementary of the paper uh, in environment international which came out in march i think it was this year but you can see that most of the contaminants and most of the risk occurs in the first 10 kilometers of all the, uh, of the cbds and when we go to the, uh, the the graphs at the bottom um what you can see here is the different colored lines the green line represents painted the red line represents unpainted and you can see it's a sort of a this is the age at the bottom older age on the left and younger age on the right and lead concentration on the y-axis and you can see very clearly if the house a house is old and it's painted it's likely that their soil contamination is going to exceed the Australian guideline for residential homes, which is 300 milligrams per kilogram. And that's indicated in both of these graphs by this dashed line. And so we can start to see now some of the factors. Proximity to the city, uh, a property age, and whether it's painted or not is an important factor in understanding whether or not your home is likely to be contaminated with soil above the Australian guideline for residential properties. So the data that we collect, the metadata that we collect, allows us to understand what the differences are in people's gardens uh, in terms of location, sample location, and also the association between soil trace metal concentrations and building material. So if we look on the uh, left-hand side of the graph here, what this does, this looks at the location of the samples and the concentration. And what we can see, fortunately, vegetable gardens are the lowest of all of the samples that we've received has a, a mean of 173 uh, and drip lines as we've thought and known about before soil samples taken underneath the drip line of a property are typically the most contaminated so the logical um, recommendation will be please don't grow veggies in your drip line soil and of course this occurs because on many older homes we might have used um, lead paint um, either on the building itself or on the guttering or, or it could be lead flashing and that water's you know, containing or, the, or, or dust or, or paint flex, for example, containing elevated concentrations of lead, because of course we use lead in, in formerly used to use lead in lead-based paint, that's um, flaked off or, and, and is collected in the soils underneath the drip line. It is quite surprising though that the veggie gardens are 173, which is um, significantly higher than typical background, natural background, which is about 30 milligrams per kilogram. And it indicates that, you know, the soil in our vegetable gardens is higher than what it would be under natural conditions. So if we go to the right hand diagram, we can look therefore here at the relationship between building material and soil lead concentrations. And what we have here, we've been able to unpick the relationship between the materials used at the property and what that might mean in terms of uh, um, soil lead concentrations. So what we can see here is that the homes which are of the most risk very clearly uh, are timber homes, which are, or which have a mean of 279 milligrams per kilogram, there's quite a spread, that's followed by metal homes, and um, buildings that are made of fibro, they tend to have uh, the lowest concentrations. So if we were to sort of unravel all of that, we would say homes closest to the city, homes which are aged, homes which are painted, and homes which are constructed of timber, those are the four factors which one could clearly associate with the greatest risk of them being lead contaminated and having a soil concentration which exceeds the Australian guideline for residential homes, which is 300 milligrams per kilogram. So when we look at the information, I'll just take a little drink of my tea. When we look at what that spatial distribution means in terms of uh, you know, where, where that occurs, we then what we've done then, uh, we've plotted the data according to statistical area uh, three, uh, which is a standardized Australian Bureau of Statistics geographic area. It's not subject to change like council areas are. And we've, plot, uh, we've done it for all of the, the three major cities in the study, Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney. And here I present for you because you know, we're in Melbourne and you know, I'm talking largely probably to a Melbourne based audience. I make an assumption there, so I'm sorry if I'm wrong, but we can see uh, the footprint is very similar to what we'd see in Sydney, that the highest uh, uh, soils occur closest to the city centre. And as we can see, as the shading increases for, uh, towards darker brown, that, that shows an incre the increased number of homes in each of those uh, geographic areas 
that would exceed the standard, which is uh, 300 milligrams per kilogram. So what we did then, once we knew that data, we then separated the data just to look at the information that related to uh, vegetables only, and um, sorry, vegetable gardens only, to try and understand what that might mean in terms of risk. And Cynthia Isley, um, our postdoc, she undertook some modeling here to look at the predicted concentration in vegetables. We looked at, we used standard modeling. We didn't measure the vegetables. Uh, we measured the soil, but we just didn't have the capacity. And that's another piece of work that would be really useful to, you know, to go back and corroborate uh, this modeling. We used the NEPM, uh, the NEPM model to calculate what the potential uptake would be for different types of vegetables. And what we found was the, um, the vegetables that were most affected were leafy vegetables. And the analysis of the, what we figured out was when we did all this analysis, the concentration that would produce exceedances of the food standard for lead, and that was the uh, contaminant of most concern, as you can see, when you look at these little ticks here, exceedances of the food standard for Australia, or the WHO FAO standard, maximum permissible limits, the only the only little triangles that appear are on the uh, are on the on the lead graph. All the other elements were below the levels of concern. And then when we look at what that means in terms of people's gardens, when we look at their veggie patch, We seem to have lost Mark, but he did tell me he was on a satellite link and, and, and he might cut out. So I guess that's what's happened there. Mark, sorry. Am I, am I okay? Yep, yep. Your satellite had just gone over or um, okay. dis disturbed your... Uh, Which one do I need to... Okay, All right. Terrific. And so what we can see, I'll just repeat that so I know we've caught that. Overall, the average was 20% of all the vegetable gardens that we analysed exceeded the, so, uh, the soil standard, uh, the standard that we'd calculated that was safe to produce food, which was 270 milligrams per kilogram. In Sydney, it was 31%, and in Melbourne and Brisbane, it was 19. So um, when we look at what that means in terms of the distribution, the footprint is very similar, is very similar to uh, the soil lead concentrations. And here you can see maps of Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and you can see that the, uh, the gardens that are most likely to exceed the concentration that is safe for the food production focus largely, but not entirely, around the city centres. And so, you know, recommendations, get the soil tested, use raised bed and bring in imported soil. It's pretty sort of basic and simple solution. And the, the VeggieSafe programme focuses on uh, really enabling, you know, home gardeners who want to produce food to produce food in a safe clean green way so we, we you know we focus not on on you've got to close this practice down but to provide solutions and so moving on from soil um later on in 2016 or so I, I sort of thought about doing some work around honey i'd seen a program in germany where people had looked at honey uh, as a biomarker or as a pollution marker in a in a, in a german airport and that sat me for a long time and uh, we did a series of work um looking at um, honey and trace metals in honey and um, as it happened when we did that work when we were trying to look whether we can use trace metals to indicate the source of honey a geographic source of honey we discovered inadvertently that about nearly 20 percent of australian honeys turned out to uh, not be authentic but that wasn't the purpose of the study and that's not really what i'm going to talk about now but i just show a couple of uh, pages on the 3rd of october from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. And, and, and this is my fantastic uh, now postdoc student with another colleague of mine, Zhao Teng Zhao, who uh, did all of the work and was involved in uh, uh, making this study happen. And I'm proud to say this is the only time I think I'll ever make page one with um, Kylie Minogue, uh, that great Melbourne icon. And so um, we set about trying to understand what's, you know, do we see contaminants in honey? And we, you know, we know what the footprint is in cities. We had a pretty good idea by 2016 what that was looking like. We hadn't published, but we had a pretty good idea. We published our first study the next year on, on the VeggieSafe data. And so um, what we did 
we went out and we worked with um, urban beekeepers. Again, an extension of our sort of citizen science work. We collaborated with, you know, the backyard beekeepers in order to collect information on both European bees and um, native bees, Tetragranolia carbonara, which is a, a very common Australian native bee and produces a lot less honey. And here's a, a summary from uh, a paper in environmental pollution in 2018, and we published some st more stuff. As you can see, there's a link here to a paper in environmental science and technology, which looks at um, you know, trace metals in bees, in, in European bees. And if you look at those studies, what you'll see is, I'm very proud to say that uh, Zhao Tang, and I was on the paper with her as a supervisor, we're the first people to be used lead isotope published lead isotopic compositions on uh, honey and uh, honeybees. And so that's a fantastic outcome, but perhaps more, more fantastic is, is the data. And what we can see on the, on the left-hand graph is an um, image comparing European and native honeybees. And actually, they're pretty similar. They're not that much different. And what you can see here is the bees contain in the order of around about 100 micrograms or 100 parts per billion, 100 micrograms per kilogram, uh, sorry, of, of lead, just maybe a little bit more in certain cases. They're not too dissimilar. The Australian native bee in brown, the Euro bee um, in green. And then when we go and then look at, you know, the question is, you know, and the question that was raised as part of this, but, uh, and, and it was a question raised by the urban beehive company in Sydney and Doug said to me, the first question that we get asked, because we make honey, we produce honey in the urban area of Sydney, is the honey clean? And that's the question that we actually sought to answer. How, and that's, in order to answer that question, we had to ascertain that the honey was authentic and that's how ultimately we found out that some honey wasn't, that didn't affect um, the urban beehive's honey, it was more commercial honeys. But what we were able to show that, as you can see on the right hand graph, is the, um, the concentrations in the honey were about 10 times lower than what it was in the bee. And that basically means the bees take all, you know, they take the hit in terms of contaminants and the honey is pretty clean. In fact, you know, 10, uh, 10 micrograms per kilogram or 10 parts per billion, that was uh, very close to the um, National Measurement of Institute's uh, limits of reporting. And then, so I, and then took the idea, that concept, and I took it to Namia. And some of you may have been to New Caledonia, and some of you may have been to Namia, and some of you may have seen, even seen the nickel smelter in Namia. And I had a sabbatical there in 2019. And I did a study working with local beekeepers to measure point source contamination from the smelter uh, on bees. And we focused on nickel, not on lead. And we did measure lead, but there's basically you know, very, very, very low levels of lead in the environment. When we published this, well, I've done a poster publish publication here. I haven't had time to write it up yet. And that's a, something on my homework list, as it were. And so what you can see in these two graphs on the right, that there is a clear measurable decline in the concentration of both lead, uh, live and dead bees uh, with distance from the smelter. And we can also see there's a clear distance decline with respect to the concentrations of nickel in honey with distance from the smelter. But if you look carefully at the graphs, you can see, as before, it's about an order of magnitude less in the bees than what it is, sorry, in the honey than what it is in the bees. So nickel in the environment bags largely the same as lead. And what this tells us is, fortunately, the, the produce that we're producing in our gardens is tr largely trace metal queen if we're producing uh, honey. But the upshot is we can use the bees as a biomarker to trace trace metal contaminants in and around the environment. And a, a piece of work, which is, I think uh, Cara's name's been uh, cut off here, but my, she's on the next slide, but this is from um, Cara Fry, who's just completing a master of research. We did another study in Sydney where we collected information on land use and also um, soil and dust deposition concentrations and bees and we can see in both cases there's quite a clear relationship between soil and dust deposition and 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 uh, trace metals in this case lead trace metal concentrations in bees and so that really that just sort of confirms what we knew already but part of this study um cara decided to look at uh, antimicrobial resistance with professor michael gilling providing his guiding hand at macquarie, is at macquarie university to do the um, antimicrobial resistance 
in the bees. And so for those that don't know, and this is not my area of expertise, this is Cara's work, the antimicrobial resistance process really works like this. So on the left-hand diagram, you have what's called the AMR train. The integrins at the front act as, uh, act as the train carriage and attached to which are the gene cassettes. And these may include antimicrobial resistance targets such as uh, uh, antibiotic resistance, mercury resistance, copper resistance and other trace metal resistance. And so that's how this is identified. And so what we did, we had 18 hives right across Sydney and we looked at those hives and we took uh, bees from each of those hives and we and well, we, I say Cara, I always say we, but really Cara did all the work. She analysed those bees for the presence of antimicrobial resistance genes. And what you can see here is in these graphs is the dashed line relates to the average number, uh, that, uh, the average number of positives across each hive for each of these different aspects, mercury, integrons, antimicrobial resistance and copper resistance. Uh, and these are samples that we collected right across Sydney. So I think what the takeaway is from this work is that bees are a great um, indicator of trace metal contaminants and they're a great reflector of um, the uh, prevailing land use. But, and perhaps more concerning, the data shows by analysis of the bees and some of them in, you know, in rural areas that antimicrobial resistance genes um, and also other trace metal resistance genes, they're absolutely prevalent irrespective of what environment we're living in. And I think we'll all be aware that AMR is a significant concern because it's proliferate use in agriculture uh, and also in humans. And um, that's obviously now escaped into the environment and now we're seeing the consequences in other uh, biomarkers. So the next bit of work that uh, we undertook, and we started this effort some time ago and it took a while to kick off. Um, and I had some initial help from um, P.B. Peterson and uh, Dr. Harvey to get this going. Uh, and then it's since been taken over by uh, uh, my student, Sarah, who's uh, here on the right hand side of this image. And we decided to look at backyard chickens and eggs. And we want to know, are they trace metal clean? And as you would probably all know, that more people now are keeping chickens in their yards than they were before. People enjoy it. It's kind of fun thing to do. They also get some food. If they've got young kids, it helps them understand food production. But the question that we asked ourselves, given the knowledge that we had, are the soils safe for birds and eggs? And so we set about to answer that question. So we did that in two ways. We went out and Sarah collected soil data at people's homes. She measured feed, she measured water, she measured um, the blood in chickens, and then she collected eggs from the chickens that we sampled the blood from, and we've analyzed the uh, the, the trace metal concentrations in all of those. I think in total there's 55 locations that we visited across Sydney and I'll present a summary of the results that we've found so far. So really the aim is to keep blood lead below 20 micrograms per deciliter, which is, sub, you know, which is no observed effect level. In humans, we say we like to keep the blood lead below five micrograms per deciliter and uh, the vet that we originally worked with with Alex Rosenwax, he told me that birds are pretty tolerant to lead exposure, but it's significantly higher than what we'd normally apply in people. And the other aim is, can we keep egg lead below 100 micrograms per kilogram, which is the WHO FAO maximum per permissible limit for lead. And so, and again, I'm focused on lead because this turns out to be the element of concern. We, we established this early on. It's the element which is most prevalent in people's yards. It's the element which is uh, most prevalent in, in the eggs. So, you know, based on the graphs and the data uh, by Sarah, as you can see on the left-hand side, there's sort of three questions or two questions that we might want to ask ourselves. If the purpose was to retain chicken blood lead levels less than 20 micrograms per deciliter, soil lead would need to be less than 143 milligrams per kilogram that's significantly, that's nearly half of what the concentration would need to be for veggie gardens, which we established at about 270, which is just under the Australian guideline of 300. The next question is, if the purpose is to produce extra consumption, a soil concentration of less than 96 milligrams per kilogram is required to keep egg levels below 100 micrograms per kilogram. That's extremely low, that's more than three times lower than the Australian HIL guideline. Thus, when you reprocess the data and look at what the relationships mean, acceptable maximum levels, um, the acceptable maximum levels because blood lead must be low, um, 
oh, there's a little typo there. That's my fault for written it. It must be less than 17.7 micrograms per deciliter in blood to ensure egg lead does not exceed 100 micrograms per kilogram. I should correct that. So what that basically means is the concentrations that we find present in people's yards in many places are significantly elevated with respect to protecting chickens from unnecessary exposure and so that those chickens have a low enough blood lead level to produce eggs that we can eat, which is the whole purpose largely for people who keep eggs, uh, keep chickens in their yard. And then the question we then asked ourselves, well, do we produce eggs in our yard and eat those, which is what the intent is when you keep chickens and that's what you know, that's what the move is, people, you know, permaculture and producing our own food. Um, or do we go and buy commercial eggs? And here, Sarah's summarized some of the data. And uh, the boxes in brown are domestic eggs, the con trace metal concentrations on the Y axis, and the different elements are on the X. And the blue boxes, which are much more clearly seen on zinc, they are the concentrations that you would find in commercial eggs. And in all cases, it is extremely clear that trace metal clean eggs are commercial eggs, not backyard eggs. And so it's a very interesting point. If you're interested in producing clean eggs, which are trace metal, low in trace metal concentrations, commercial eggs may be the way to go. And so we took the data on soil lead. And um, we then transformed the latest, uh, latest cut of the data, more than 7,000 samples from Sydney, knowing what the average soil concentration was per statistical area. And we worked out what the footprint of was of areas where the soil exceeded the chicken safe, chicken egg safe, ultimately egg safe production level of 96 milligrams per kilogram. And this graph here shows you the outcome of that analysis. The dots in the middle relate to the mean residential soil lead concentration for each statistical area. And the brown footprint gives you the, the dark brown footprint gives you the area where the soil lead exceeds 96 milligrams per kilogram, where it's, the modeling shows you will result in producing an egg concentration which exceeds WO, WHO, F, you know, FAO standards, the maximum permissible limits. And we use that because there's no Australian standard. There's only the food basket survey. And then the lighter, lighter brown area is the area that you can see, which is trace metal clean. So we can see, you know, looking at soil, looking at vegetable patches, looking at uh, bees, and then looking at uh, at chickens, we can see there are different concentrations and thresholds and different effects from trace metals in backyards about safety and acceptability of producing food in each of those locations. And so then the question arises, well, this is now moving from Melbourne up to Broken Hill and the most recent study, which I think came out this week, it was out in proofs, but it came out finally this week uh, by Max Gillings, my, another MRES student of mine, a uh, study that we've been working at Broken Hill for some time. And this looks at the relationship between outdoor and indoor. And we had uh, matched samples here. And we've seen sort of similar sort of stories from Sydney in a couple of studies and other locations. But this is a really exquisite study that Max collects a lot of really useful data and the data uh, this uh, data story is also supplemented by blood lead levels that we have from the cohort of information uh, that we have from from Broken Hill, and, and that goes in that relationship is installed in, in significant detail in the publication. But I'm just going to focus here on the yards and what the yards mean for homes. So on the left hand diagram, we can see soil lead concentration, and the pattern is very similar for zinc and other mine related contaminants we can see that there is a clear distance decline, whether you're looking at front yard soils or house dust with distance from the mining operations. That's precisely what you would anticipate, particularly when you know that the mining operations, and indeed there's not one mining operation that I've ever found that does not have offsite impacts. It just doesn't exist. And what you can see that there's a clear distance decline. But what's interesting is that the concentrations are significantly different in the house dust versus the front yard soil, particularly with distance from the mining operations. And this is captured uh, with a box plot on the right hand side. 
and um, you can see that what is outdoors gets indoors and what gets indoors is very hard to get out and we know the stuff that is indoors is coming from outdoors because we did lead isotopic composition analysis on samples of the house dust indoors and it matched not only the outdoor samples but also it matches very closely the lead isotopic composition of the ore which is extracted at Broken Hill and um, we know that that shifts as well with distance from the mining operations as it's diluted by natural background materials so when we take all that information what do we get well we need to have clean soil for clean food we recommend that people should get their soils tested use raised beds use mulching and provide clean sand pits for children so that they're not accidentally contaminating or exposing themselves you need to determine based upon your soil analysis if your garden is suitable for keeping chickens people need to leave the shoes outside so they don't migrate outdoors to indoors and of course washing vegetables we should always wash our vegetables um, but that's particularly a concern when you're living in the inner city um, and then carry on gardening our program is designed for people to carry on gardening not to scare the living daylights of them so they don't carry on gardening because the benefits of gardening even in places and such as in the cities far outweighs the trace metal risk and i can say that because we went and we modeled the relationship in broken hill between soil lead concentration and blood lead and brian gulson did something very similar in sydney and it a thousand i think off the top of my head a thousand milligrams per kilogram of soil lead concentration equates to 1.2 micrograms per deciliter of blood lead and the average blood lead of australians of kids under five is one or less than one based on some recent data that's in the general major cities not in broken hill for example and um the threshold for intervention according to the national medical research council is five micrograms so my point being you have to have very contaminated soil to really start worrying that my kids are going to get leaded from soil only so we've then gone on i'm running out of time here we've then gone and assessed uh, assessed our work and i won't dwell much on this but we've gone out and we've asked people who participate in our program do you like it do you learn from it did you get any benefit from this and we can see you know just i capture it here this paper's gone out for a review and environmental science and policy but one 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 young child was so excited she now wants to become an environmental scientist you know and that's just fantastic outcome most people understood science more they took action to reduce the contaminants which is the diagram up here on the left hand side you know the places that were contaminated match up to places where there, there was intervention undertaken we've published our data it's all available uh, on the veggie safe stuff you can find it on google scholar and it'll take you to its open access you can look at those studies um, but perhaps more importantly you can go to mapmyenvironment.com and look at trace metal contaminants not only in australia but around multiple places around the world both in soil and dust and it allows you to understand you know what your data is compared to other neighboring people and here's just a summary map from Melbourne on the left hand side this is from uh, map my environment that's all the sample points a cut of the sample points uh, uh, with a, a concentration of lead shown and on the right that's the indoor dust from the dust safe program we've published a lot of our studies in order to uh, a, a lot of those studies whether it's on indoor dust or nickel smelters or bees or dust in broken hill they've had a component of those have been citizen scientists who've either supplied samples or given access to gardens and bees such as in new caledonia for example or, or in sydney and it's been a fantastic experience both for us and, and the partners we've shared the results with them have usually been quite interested in the results and some you know as you can see their interaction shows that many of them have taken uh, intervention activities pers pursuant to the evidence that we've provided so moving forward, um, I won't dwell too much on this, uh, but um, in my new role as the Chief Environmental Scientist at EPA, we have a significant um, effort in the citizen science area. We're just about to get uh, all being well. We're going to get some new equipment that's going to allow us to do uh, analysis um, 
at the EPA and we're in the process of building a new program that we hope to be able to announce in the new year. It's the same basis of what we've done at Macquarie. We're going to develop a two-way partnership, improve scientific literacy and education and engage people in their environment so that they can uh, understand contaminants and take uh, interventive action. So on my, this is my very last slide. There is a fantastic number of opportunities with respect to soil contamination, whether it's research, teaching or employment opportunities. Toxic contaminants, they're persistent, prevalent and problematic. And the levels of concern are typically being driven lower as we understand more. We are clear that this needs to be dealt with. It can be a pragmatic, it doesn't have to be dig the whole place up and start again. We can have pragmatic solutions, which is what we offer through the VeggieSafe program. Collecting good, clear, strong data can stimulate individual and regulatory action to take interventions. And we've had success at Broken Hill and Mount Isa and uh, Port Perry in that regard before. More so for university types, it provides endless opportunities for interesting and engaging research work, for building knowledge and careers and understanding the linkage and the nexus between human health and the environment. And ultimately, the objective of all of our work and all the work that I've done and the work that I will do as the chief environmental scientist is to produce better outcomes for both people and the environment. And on that, I'm 60 minutes and I might have gone over. I apologise if I've gone over a little bit. That's my very last slide and we'll open to questions. Thank you, Mark. And indeed, uh, we will take questions. I just wanted to say that was fascinating and I'm going to get my garden soil tested. Um, all right, we have quite a few questions. Can I just remind everybody that if you've got questions, you could put them in the Q&A and uh, we will go through a few. And let's start with Amber Kerwin and uh, we're going to try opening microphones so people can um, ask their question directly. And if not, I will read out the question. Amber, are you there? John, um, there's a lot of people that have joined as Amber Cohen, so that's actually not the names of the people. So those ones we need to treat, we're not too sure who they are um, because they joined under my name as the link, unfortunately. So if you are able to, um, we'll just ask that anonymously to Mark, anything that's linked on Amber's name. Right, okay, they're mostly going to come up as Amber, are they? Well, actually, they, they certainly don't. are. I'm so some, popular today. <laughs> some do, some don't. That means I'll probably have to read them all out. Um, actually, well, interesting. Some do, some don't. Um, okay. Well, look. Let's let, let me let me um, read one out and get Mark answering it, and then we'll sort this out. So the the first um, person that's uh, put a question in Mark says, "Wonderful talk. Excellent. Thank you for sharing the work." Um, is the distance from the CD from the CBD effect of lead in garden soils confounded by house age. Um, I think you did address that. Very old houses, yeah. houses close to the city probably still standing, whereas houses further from the city, perhaps out farms, are more likely to have been knocked down and rebuilt as the city has expanded. Um, I think you did address that, but is there an actual issue about actually knocking down houses and releasing lead as well as old houses well, yes, that, that painted? Uh, yeah, I think that's a fair question. and. Yes, the answer is we have, uh, it's well established that, you know, lead dust we've collected in people's ceilings and in the wall cavities, and that can generate lead contaminated dust when a house is pulled down or renovation works are undertaken. But overall, if you look at the overall picture, the overall picture is that there are four key elements, age of house, proximity to the city, timber construction and painting. And if you think about what, you know, the many of our older homes, in Australia, they were timber homes and they were painted in order to preserve the wood. And so, yes, of course, older homes that, you know, and, the, and a, a good case, an example may be police stations, which are them themselves are quite old, but they're often not say located in city centres. There was some work done recently that showed that they were full of um, asbestos and both lead because of their age. And so, yes, there are always anomalies, but the data that I provided is on, you know, sort of the, the overall picture of what we see. But if you have an old home out of the city and it's uh, been painted, it's likely that that paint, at least some of that paint at the deeper layers will be lead based. And you need to think about, you know, when you do renovation and typically you can, the painters and decorators association have, you know, they do training for lead abatement, but you need to find a, a painter who's specifically trained in lead abatement. And that usually means 
you know, shielding off the area so it doesn't go into your neighbours or it doesn't go into the soil. It's the same thing like when you're dealing with asbestos. You enclose the area, you remove it and clean up afterwards. Thank you. Well, the next one um, is about manure and I'll extend it to sort of bags of compost. But so the next uh, question says, well, what about manure in vegetable gardens? Um, I suppose thinking about your chickens that accumulated uh, heavy metals in their eggs, then you could also argue that perhaps um, uh, animals such as cattle might accumulate heavy metals and might, uh, that might be represented in the manure. And then you use bags of manure on your garden, on your vegetable garden. Should we be you worried about them? Should we be worried about manure and uh, uh, composts? Have well, there's quite a... Yeah, so it's a good, you raise a very good question and it's a piece of work that I never got round to do, but it's a piece of work that needs to be done. I, and we've discussed that actually recently at the EPA, should we go around and sample uh, soil and potting mix that is available and manufactured soil. So a lot of the soil, I mean, soil takes thousands of years to produce, as you will know. And so often we produce what's called manufactured soil, which is recovered elements from, from waste. And I think some of that, unfortunately, is probably a bit contaminated. And we've got some anecdotal information that indicates that is the case. And of course, there's, there's a reuse of biosolids on agricultural lands. In, and, you know, we have to do something with all of this waste and we need a beneficial reuse of it. And so there are strict limits around metal con trace metal concentrations allowable. And I can't reel them off the top of my head because I don't have, have them in my head allowable in, in uh, agricultural waste or human waste, which then reuse for agricultural production. I think if I was to summarily, summarily answer your question, I think overall I would say probably the answer is no, but there's nothing wrong with getting, if you've got a new veggie garden, getting those soils retested, because there is some anecdotal evidence that some of that soil, it's repurposed from different sites, blended and mixed. And so, you know, soil doesn't come from nowhere. So we just, yep. I think the answer, the answer is it's probably not a huge risk, but I think there are cases where the soil concentrations would exceed acceptable levels. And, you know, we're only measuring for trace metals here. Okay, thank you. Let me go to Gregory Ball, if Gregory is there. And uh, if you are there, Gregory, can you, you could ask your question live by unmuting your microphone. You've got a couple of questions here. Gregory? Okay, maybe not. Uh, so I can see that Gregory, Gregory, you just have to unmute and you can ask a question. If you can hear me? Yep, we can hear you. particular food crops that do not absorb much lead from the soil. For example, what about leafy green vegetables, such as silver beet, that many people would grow in their garden? I think I got that. I think, look, if you in one of the slides and it's in the data in brief paper it is true they they absorb actually relatively small amounts of light from the soil but it, it the model is all the best available data and the standard napper model that the leafy greens are the ones which are likely to absorb the greatest concentrations of trace metals and the modeling showed that it was the leafy greens that were most at risk from soil trace metal contamination fruiting veg or fruit trees carry on Forget about it. Don't worry about it. It's not a level of concern. But, you know, the primary concern revolves around uh, leafy greens. And, you know, there is some research which shows, you know, um, vegetables grown in the ground as well, such as carrots and potatoes, that they too can acquire trace metal contaminants just, you know, largely by virtue of uh, a physical contact. Does that help answer your question? Yes. Gregory, you had another question. Would you like to ask that as well? Um, are there any harmful trace metals absorbed by foods grown in freshly crushed basalt soil? Um, some people may use that as a import that as a soil mm. in which to grow vegetables in the house. Also, it's one of the um, topics being discussed um, in regards uh, for um, absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. In the future, more crops might be grown in crushed basalt. Um, I'll, I'll be honest; I don't know the answer to that. I think it depends, you know, it depends upon the particle size, and it depends upon uh, what the trace metals are of concern. Uh, we analysed, if I remember the list, arsenic, 
uh, cadmium, chromium, copper, manganese, nickel, lead, zinc. They're the elements that we focused on. We did do mercury originally, but it, 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 uh, a portable XRF isn't adequate really for measuring mercury, let alone some of the other ones, it's less good, but lead's fine. And it's the element of most concern in, in, in gardens. So with respect to basalt soils, I don't know, it would need greenhouse, uh, kind of greenhouse um, studies to ascertain what that is and, and against a range of plants. You could do a proxy by going to look at basalt rich soils um, and there are a few of those, quite a few locations around Australia where that's the case, and then figure out what elements you need to target based upon the concentrations in the soil. Okay, okay. thank you. Good. Um, Anita Lawrence, are you there? Um, okay, let me ask Anita's question. Um, yeah, I don't see her coming on. As Australians are encouraged to move towards a more plant-based diet, are you planning to model the impacts on contaminants? How about the impact of imported food? Rice milk has been shown to have high arsenic. Um, yeah, I suppose that might be a question about what's the EPA going to do about things like um, imported uh, foods or measuring contaminants in foods. Well, I think that's... And I hate to say, this just sounds like I'm just doing a flick pass, but that's not the in the EPA's bucket. Food safety sits, you know, that would be more Department of Health, and it'd probably sit at a federal level um, with Food Standards Australia. There is quite a bit of work and interest, though, with um, our national laboratories, the National Measurement Institute. They've got significant interest in uh, food and trace metal concentrations, and that work's ongoing in different areas, but it's not really... That doesn't fall within the, the remit of the Environment Protection Authority. But I acknowledge, independent of that, I acknowledge that uh, the presence of arsenic in, in several foodstuffs is, a, is an element of concern, particularly in organic arsenic, not organic, which we get in fish. Okay, thank you. Changing the uh, topic a little bit, not what you talked about, but probably of interest to some people and follows on from what you were talking about. How about um, removing heavy metal contaminants such as lead from soils? Uh, can this be done? And I'm aware that there are various bacteria and things or, that might take up these heavy metals. Would you like to I'll give an answer to that question? Yeah, uh, look, there are different ways of doing this. And one of them is, you know, people have often touted uh, phyto, uh, phytoremediation, growing plants to suck up the, the, the metals and then, you know, getting rid of the plants. But, you know, ultimately it doesn't really go anywhere. It ends up going in a landfill. And so you're really just transferring the problem, unfortunately. But I guess it gets it out of the urban environment. So, I mean, the other way that people can, you know, remediate their yards, they can add phosphorus, they can add, people have looked at adding, um, Fish bones, which is, it contains calcium and phosphorus to help bind up the lead in the garden soil. But I think what I would say to people is that's all highly complicated and you can do that. You can even dig up your whole garden and replace it with clean soil. It's just invasive. It's not very practical. And what we focus on in this program is practical solutions for, you know, mums and dad gardeners, that they can do something easily, cheaply, you know, even creating you know, a sandpit or a raised bed creates a feature in the garden and you know, provides a focus for, for, for home food production. You know, most of the uses in the garden, you know, growing decorative plants and trees and things, it's, it's, it's not a significant, it's not a real concern. Just mulching the areas in between those, raise bed, keep your grass nice and long, and, you know, and then you can carry on enjoying your garden. You know, we're not really recommended in any way, shape or form that people hold us, bowl us, dig up the front yard. It's costly, it's not real practical, and it's probably not really necessary. Okay, here's an interesting one. Uh, Hossein Riazi, are you there? Would you like to ask your question? Uh, if you just unmute, you should be able to ask your question. If not, I'll read it out. Okay. This isn't working terribly well, but this is a, a, a different, um, uh, different way of looking at this. And the question is, could some contaminants be useful like copper and zinc? Um, and I might include selenium there. I mean, some soils are known to be low in selenium and that can be poor for health, for example. And so, you know, should we, that there is presumably a level of these kinds of uh, elements in soils, which is actually healthy. And sometimes if they're too low, it's unhealthy. So uh, can, they, can they be useful? 
I think the answer, simple answer is yes. Like, you know, zinc's a macronutrient, as is copper and a, a variety of other elements, and, and including manganese as well, at certain concentrations. And um, the Australian, uh, the NEPM guidelines, which are designed for a range of scenarios, residential gardens at the bottom right through to industrial locations, they're designed for human health. The human health investigation levels, they're not agricultural investigation levels per se. However, we took those guidelines, the Australian HIL guidelines, and then looked at those, like, what does that mean for contaminants which we know that are significantly prevalent? And that's how we did it. We did, you know, of course, the XRF will collect a range of, I forget how many trace metals, 30, 40 trace metals, but you know, some are better than others. The heavier that they are, the, the more accurate the data is, but you can correct for all of that. But we focused on the ones that were typical common anthropogenic contaminants, you know, lead, zinc, copper, you know, arsenic, cadmium, they're very common and they're all toxic, but, you know, particularly at high, you know, zinc less so, but, you know, particularly at high, high levels. And so I accept that comment. Yes, some of them will be relevant and some of them are needed at minimum levels. But I think the concentration for zinc in soils for HILA, which is residential gardens, very high, 7,400. So there's not many soils other than probably around a mineralized ore body, that are going to be more than 7,400. So, you know, the concentrations that are present naturally in soils in most cases will be probably adequate for, for production. And indeed, you know, you can easily add um, amendments to the soil to improve their productivity. Okay, thank you. Here's another one. Uh, this one is asking about different limits. And the question is, why is the lead limit in soil so high at 300 milligrams per kilogram, while for copper it's only 100 milligrams per kilogram, um, and copper's not as toxic as lead? Hey, copper's not 100. Um, I forget now. I'd have to go and look it up. It's not 100. I should know this. It's terrible. I've forgotten. It's not 100. Arsenic's okay. 100. Uh, chromium is 100, but chromium is based on hexavalent chromium. Um, lead, look, let me just talk about the lead because I know about that. The, the, the level of 300 milligrams per kilogram was originally set based upon a blood lead level of 10 micrograms per deciliter. From my memory, looking at the NEPM, they revisited that and they based it on 7.5 micrograms per deciliter as a threshold. And they reviewed it all and they decided they didn't need to reduce it. The NEPM also assumes that the lead is only 50% bioavailable. So that means only 150 milligrams per kilogram, which, you know, that's kind of a, a way of addressing some of those issues. However, the work that we've done, as I said, myself and Professor Brian Golson, shows very clearly that soil on its own is not a significant contributor to blood lead exposure. And we've looked at, I think it's more than, I forget exactly the number, more than 6,000 samples in matched soil and blood samples in Broken Hill and Brian used a smaller number but he came out with a similar relationship between soil concentration and blood lead outcomes and in both and they were very similar there was 0.2 difference between them actually 0 0.02 difference and so the point being is that it's um, the evidence is pretty clear that soil unless you're eating it which is very rare, is not a major contributor to human health risk. It's the dust that the soil produces. That's the concern. I hope that answers the question. Um, Mark, a last question perhaps, and uh, this one from me. And I was interested in the bees and just turning to bees. Um, I noticed in your study of bees that uh, if you got close to the smelter you were talking about, um, yes. they seemed to be quite close to the smelter, a lot of dead bees. So um, do, do these high levels of uh, uh, yeah. metals in bees uh, yeah. cause the bees to die? Or you know, is it perhaps inhibiting their immune systems and then they get some infections and die? There's a lot of concern about the health of bees around the world. Yeah, look, that's a really good question. And um, a colleague of mine, uh, Professor um, uh, uh, Andy Barron, he's, kind of, he's been looking specifically at the neurotoxicity of metals on bees. And it's just like humans. It does interfere with the, the bees' ability to make decisions about where to forage and how long to forage and send the messages back. As part of this study, what we wanted to know is, you know, we, we looked at the association between, it's in the ES&T study, the association between bees, 
and um, dead bees and live bees. And we were able to show that the bees accumulate the trace metals as they age. We didn't ask the question that you're asking, does it cause them to die? And I think the answer is possibly, but we don't really know that in our particular studies. But what we can show is that, and the reason why we did this is we can show that dead bees contain more than live bees. And the purpose of that is to show very clearly that the bees accumulate, because the bees live in the winter, they live longer, but in the summer, they may live you know, about four weeks or something, four to six weeks max, because they're busy foraging. But we wanted to show that the bees were a biomarker. They were collecting contaminants going around in the natural environment. And by looking at live and dead bees, that's why we did that analogy. And so um, that's, I hope that answers your question. I don't, I think the evidence is that the toxicity, certainly the toxicity of organic chemicals, neonicotinoids is bad for bees. And it now appears through some preliminary research that's come out in a few places that manganese and lead and arsenic also cause similar adverse neurotoxic outcomes in bees. But the, we just collected, so in that study in Yamiya, I collected dead bees. I had a program where I collected them in front of the hive. I collected the dead bees. At the same time, I went back and analyzed for live bees. Um, in fact, I think I got the bees just once. I think I got them, I took them, one, sampled them once. I took the live bees each week, but I averaged them for the hive because they were all dead bees over that period of time, over the four week period that we're sampling. And, you know, purpose being is to demonstrate that the bees accumulate trace metals with age. Does that help answer your question to some half answer your question? It does. You get sort of uh, heads in that direction. Uh, uh, yeah. It's an interesting issue, bee health. Um, one we have to take seriously, I think. Yeah, well, um, unfortunately, we don't have a row amount here, which is the worst thing that we could get. That's right. Yes. Well, although, you know, we, that's, uh, that's luck, I think, to a large extent and uh, may well arrive here soon. But yes, hope not, correct. But, uh, yeah. Okay, Mark, thank you very much for um, your presentation today. And I thought that was really interesting and informative. And I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank everybody who asked questions today as well. I'm sorry you didn't get to ask them personally. I think we have a bit of work to do there on opening up our microphones and the way that uh, we deal with the questions. I've been asked to draw your attention to the VeggieSafe website. Uh, Mark uh, gave you the address for that. And it's also in the chat where you can read more about the uh, uh, the way you can have your soil analyzed so you can send your soil in. Mark, thanks so much uh, for Thank your you very time much today indeed. and for ta taking part uh, in the, um, and for giving the 30th Memorial Leaper Lecture. An honor. Um, I'd like to hand over now to Samantha Grover, who's president of the Victorian branch of Soil Science Australia. Samantha. You're on mute. You're on mute. Thanks, John. On behalf of the Victorian branch of Soil Science Australia, I would sincerely like to thank both Mark and John. Soil Science Australia is really delighted to co-present the LEAPA lecture with the University of Melbourne as part of the Dean's lecture series. And thank you, John, for chairing and moderating the many um, questions that Mark's talk generated. Mark, thank you so much for being our 30th LEAPA speaker. It's a, it's a, um, LEAPA was a very um, influential and um, engaging character and so big shoes to fill and you have definitely done that with this talk this year. There's been an enormous number of additional questions in the chat that we couldn't get to today. And I think the work that you've shared on soils um, locally and up in Broken Hill, the links between where we live and some of the um, things that people are really enjoying doing with growing vegetables and chickens and thinking about backyard honey is obviously really topical this year. I think it's fair to say that your team at VeggieSafe is likely to be flooded with additional soil samples sent from today's audience. Um, John mentioned he's going to be sending his soils and I certainly will be as well. Thank you so much. 
Thank you very much indeed. I really appreciate being the um, speaker on the 30th anniversary of the LEAP lecture. It's an honour. And also, welcome. Um, Victorians are really delighted to welcome you and we, we look forward to getting more involved um, in the citizen science work that the EPA Victoria is going to be launching early next year. Thank you. Well, well let's talk about it then when we get it through. <laughs> We will, we will, and we'll certainly share that with our members. I just want to alert those of you who are in the audience who are Soil Science Society members that we have got another few events coming up soon. You can join either online or in person the federal and state annual general meetings of Soil Science Australia. They're both going to be held at the University of Melbourne on the 7th of December. So I hope to see some of you there. And if you're a member or if you're not a member of Soil Science Australia, there's the opportunity to get involved in the World Soils Day Bake Off. You can include some of your own produce um, from your garden if you're feeling creative or your eggs. Um, and have a look in the chat to see the link to the World Soils Day Bake Off. For those of you who aren't very fixated on the 5th of December as World Soils Day. I would just remind you that World Soils Day is close, um, but any time between now and then you can create a cake, either um, a soil, soil themed cake or particularly um, focusing in on this year's topic around salinization and halting the salinization of our soils and share a photo of your soil themed cake on social media and there'll be a number of judges and there's a number of different categories. So get baking and hope to see you at a Soil Science Society event soon. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.